wisely is the focus, our pulpit focus for 2020. Now, living wisely entails embracing certain character traits of virtues. Now, these traits enrich not just our lives, but that of our community and society as well. Now, one of the most important traits is honour. Unfortunately, the virtue of honour is lost in the contemporary culture of our advanced and affluent societies like Singapore. Now, in the past, actually only a few decades ago, the virtue of honour is highly esteemed in all culture and societies. Honour was deemed more important than wealth and power. Uh, it's an alien concept for some people sitting here, especially the younger ones. In the past, that's how it is. But nowadays, it's like get a good job, get a good career, make a lot of money, and that is something that is more noble than anything else. But in the past, okay, the virtue of honour is more important than wealth and power. And it was the character trait that decent men and women aspire to possess. Now, nowadays, hardly anyone talk about honour anymore, except maybe the older ones. So if I would ask you, what are the five character traits that you value the most? Or if I put it another way, what are the five virtues you want to develop in your life? Now, I suspect that for many of you, uh, the virtue of honour won't be featured amongst these five values uh, or virtues, right? Honour is an old-fashioned virtue. It is a forgotten virtue. I, I was tempted to entitle my sermon, The Lost Vir Virtue of Honour, instead of just the virtue of honour, uh, just to make a point. Now, honour is an important idea for the proper functioning of a civil society or for any community. It is also a very important biblical idea. So we are going to explore the virtue of honour in our next few sermons. Today's sermon is the first sermon in a mini-series uh, on honour. Now through the sermons, I hope to convince you of the importance of honour such that you will be motivated to cultivate this highly esteemed biblical virtue. I also hope to see a culture of honour develop in our own families and also our church. A community with a culture of honour will see the community and its members thrive and flourish as the people live and interact with one another respectfully, responsibly and constructively. This is the will of God. This is the will of God. You cannot live the abundant life that our Lord Jesus talked about in John's Gospel without the virtue of honour, as in honouring God, honouring those in authority over you and honouring the people that are around you. I have only two points for today's sermon. They are framed in the form of questions. By answering these two questions, I trust that you will understand and appreciate the concept of honour better. Now, the first question is, what is honour? The second question is, why is honour important? So let's answer the first question first. What is honour? Simply stated, to honour is to value. Can we put it up? To honour is to value, to consider as worthy whether the object of honour is a person or something else. So if I were to say that I honour someone, it means that he or she is worthy of my respect. To honour is to, to, to value. Honour is also a value and an important one. In sociological term, a value is a principle or standard of behaviour that is important in life. It is also what the society considers to be important for its 
proper and healthy functioning and thriving. Now as such, consciously and unconsciously, members of the community will put pressure on one another to conform to these values. How do they do it? So if you adhere to the values, you will win honour. You'll be respected as an exemplary and responsible member of the community. However, if you do not adhere to the values and step out of line, you'll be scorned and looked at with contempt. If it is serious, you may be disgraced or shamed. Now, let me give you an example that is taken from the Bible. Now, in almost all societies in the past, sexual purity and propriety is a highly esteemed value. So sexual immorality is frowned upon in a big way. Fornication, there's a biblical word for premarital sex. Fornication is condemned. Adultery is condemned. In the Old Testament culture, adultery was punishable by stoning to death. It tells us of the seriousness with which God attached to sexual misconduct. Now, consider the Samaritan woman whom Jesus met at Jacob's well. Jesus was resting at the well as the disciples went to town to buy lunch. And the Bible tells us that it was the sixth hour. You know, the Jews counted the day beginning at 6 a.m. in the morning. So the sixth hour is noontime, 12 p.m. in the afternoon. Now, it was not customary for women folks to go to the well to collect water and do washing because that is the hottest time of the day. So it's a logical thing, right? The woman will go in the early hours of the morning or they'll go in the late afternoon when the sun is softer. So the question is, why did this Samaritan woman go to the well at such an odd hour? The answer is very simple. She was avoiding the other woman. She was embarrassed to be seen in their company. They laughed and they talked to one another, but they would avoid talking to her. They will make gestures and whisper in harsh tones as they look in a direction, but they will avoid her altogether as much as she avoided them. They shun her like a plate. Why? Why? Because she was an immoral woman. As we'll read in that gospel passage later, she had had five husbands. And the man with whom she was living at that time was not her husband. Now this explains why the woman shunned her. She has stepped out of line from their highly cherished societal values of sexual purity and propriety. So nobody wanted to be associated with her or to be seen to be associated with her. She was ostracized. She lived in shame and disgrace. She would live in dishonor for the rest of her life. And the shame would go down with her to the grave. Now, that was how society in the past upheld values and honor and, and virtues. It forced the people to live and to act in a responsible way. In this sense, it was for the collective good of the society. The downside is that forgiveness is not forthcoming. Even when the person who did wrong repented, he will live with the shame for the rest of his life. Usually, he had no reprieve. Okay? For the rest of his life, he will bear with the stain of dishonor. That is why Jesus giving the living water to the Samaritan woman was such a big deal to her. The offer means forgiveness and acceptance 
from God if she would repent. In offering living water, the living water, Jesus was offering to wipe away not just her sins, but also her shame. In the offering of the living water, Jesus was offering to remove her disgrace and to restore dignity and honour to her. Now, in her immorality, the Samaritan woman lost honour. Lost her honour. Now, honour is an interesting value. It is associated with other values and virtues. In an interesting way, it is affected by these values and it also affects the cultivations of all these other values and virtues, directly and indirectly. Now, let me explain that. Let me explain that. Besides sexual purity and propriety, there are other important values and virtues embraced by most society, past and present. For example, filial piety, courage, sacrifice, integrity, honesty, reliability, righteousness, kindness, graciousness, lack of contentiousness, humility, civility, and wisdom. Now, if a person has a healthy measure of these values, he will be held in esteem and honour by members of the community. He will be considered an honourable person. However, if he does not adhere to these values that are highly cherished and esteemed by that community, it will affect his honour. It will diminish his honour. For example, let me give you an example. If courage and sacrifice is a highly prized value in a particular community, like back in ancient China, you know, Ye Fei, Jing Zhong Pao Guo, something like that, okay, if it's highly cherished, then a fit and healthy young man who dodge enlistment to the army will bring shame and disrepute and dishonor not just to himself, but also to his family. Now, on the flip side, the desire for honour encourages people to cultivate other good values and virtues. A desire to be honourable motivates them to nurture good attitudes and appropriate behaviours. People will behave more responsibly. Parents will put priority on the character formation of their children. You know, in our modern culture in Singapore right now, parents are pushing their children to do well in school, to have a good education. The idea is that at the end of the day, it will make them feel proud, and when they grow up, the children will, have, will be able to get a good job and have, make a good living. The idea of character formation, the idea of character building is not a priority anymore. But in a culture that puts honour and respect as a high priority, parents will balance that up and parents will ensure that their children grow up with good character. Now, as a result of that, the society will be more cultured. It will be safer, more peaceful, more harmonious, more trusting, more orderly. Such society and communities stand a better chance to thrive and to prosper. So, honour is a source of motivation for the cultivation of many, others, many other virtues and values. It is a source of motivation. It motivates us to cultivate all the other values that our community or our society deem as good. So honour, you can see honour is something that is very important. Now for other virtues and values, they sort of, they stand alone individually, but honour is connected to all these other values and virtues. And it also affects the cultivation of all these other values and virtue. As Jason Georges said in his book, Ministering 
in honor shame cultures. He says this when social reputation, reputation is the basic foundation of life and identity, people's pursuit of honor, respect, and status frames every facet of life. Now, so that you know, the stories and the narratives in our Bible are set against the background of honor-shame culture. It is the same for both the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Bible, we observe that God bestows honor on those who honor Him. And then, on the flip side, those who related to Him dishonorably or treated other people with contempt will be put to shame. We see this idea resonates throughout the Bible, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The Bible background is an honor-shame culture. Now, let me just give you an example. <clears throat> this example bridges the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay? In the opening chapter of the Gospel of Luke, we read about the priest Zechariah receiving a piece of good news from, the angel, from an angel that his wife would bear him a son. So well, some of you will say that that's not, not exactly an exceptional news until you read further and you understand that Zechariah's wife, Elizabeth, was barren. They had given, help, given up hope long ago and now they were old in age and past childbearing age. Now look at how Elizabeth responded to the good news. Okay, let's look at Luke 125. The Lord had done for me, the Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Favor represents honor. Okay, disgrace is dishonor. Elizabeth frame her joy in an honor-shame language. God has shown her favor and removed her shame, removed the disgrace away from her. Now in ancient time, actually until not too long ago, women considered barrenness a disgrace. Are you aware of that? Maybe it's just this generation. Okay, or when I'm young. But before that, women considered barrenness a disgrace. The rationale was that a woman's primary function is to bear children. And therefore, if she cannot reproduce, it will bring dishonor to herself and her family. Okay, that is the way people think. Okay, it's not true, but that's the way people think. As we see in the cases of Sarai, Rachel, Hannah, and the figurative woman in Isaiah 54 that represents Israel, God intervened to turn their shame to honor by opening up their wombs. So let's read Isaiah chapter 54, verse 1 and verse 4. Sing, O barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song, shout for joy, you who, never, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, say the Lord. For you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. Do not be afraid. You will not suffer shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will not forget the shame of your youth and remember no reproach and, and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. If you notice the language, Israel's fortune is framed in an honor shame language, which the Israelites and the people living at that time understood perfectly well. This is God's promise for them. The Lord would turn their barrenness into fruitfulness. The Lord will turn their shame and disgrace and humiliation into dignity and glory and honor. 
Okay, it was framed in that kind of language. Nothing has changed in the Middle East. The Middle Easterner today still understand this honor shame language. In fact, 80% of the world still understand, I mean 80% of the world understand this honor shame language. 80%, okay, because the predominant culture worldwide, even today, is the honor shame culture. Only 20% of the world find this concept of honor and shame alien and unfamiliar. Now, these are the Westerners, the Americans. Yeah, I see the American there shrugging her shoulder. The Americans, the Europeans, that we include the Australians and the Kiwis. And the pseudo-Westerners. Okay, by pseudo-Westerners, I'm referring to those other people that, who have been influenced and conditioned by Western culture through education, the media, and Hollywood. Now, this group includes many of us, me included, many of us sitting here and those who are watching me on the live stream. So to you, I want to say that the virtue of honour is not just an old-fashioned or traditional value. It is also a biblical value and concept and a very important one. The value of honour, the virtue of honour is a very important one. Honour undergirds our relationships with God. And honour undergirds our relationship with the people around us. Okay, people in authority, people in the family, people in church, people in the government, in our workplace, in our school. Honour undergirds all our relationships. Not only do the ancient Israelites and modern Christians understand the importance of honour, people in almost every civilization and age also think so. Now, and we, regardless of our race, our colour and our culture, have a deep desire for honour. We all have a deep desire for honour. Why? Can it be that God has coded the virtue of honour into the human consciousness and conscience? Is it possible that God has hardwired the desire for honour into the human psyche? I think so. More importantly, that's what the Bible says. Now, in the creation account in Genesis, we observe that God created many things, right? From the heavenly bodies, the glorious heavenly bodies, the stars, the moons, the planets, to the variety of vegetations, plant, flowers, trees in all the varieties, and a variety of animals, birds, and water creatures, things that lurk in the depth of the ocean. Now, at the end of each creation day, the Bible tells us that God saw that it was good, However, on the sixth day, at the end of the sixth day, after creating man in his image, God's remark was, it was very good. It was very good. Every other creation was good. But the creation of man in the glorious image of God was very good. Why? Why? David gives us the answer in the number 8 Psalm. Psalms 8 verses 3 to 6. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honour. You know, the verse is saying, basically the verse is saying here, they are not as glorious looking. They doesn't seem to be, right? Compared to the sun, moons and stars and all these things. And humans are made a little lower than the angels, than the Elohims, not referring to God, but the heavenly being. Yet God has crowned him with glory and honour. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. 
You have put all things under his feet. Now the David psalmist couldn't comprehend what was so special about humans. Perhaps David understood the sinfulness and the frailty of man. I mean, he looked at himself. He looked at the sins that he has committed. He said, look, we men are corrupted. We men are really nothing. Or perhaps he looked at the stars. He looked at the planets. He looked at what's in the universe and it's all by what he saw. And so comparatively, man was nothing. But then David also understood that God has created humans differently. David understood that God has created humans differently. We are created in the image of God. So we are bestowed with glory and honour. I think many of us know that we are bestowed with, in a sense, glory. God crowns us with glory. But honour, the word honour is there. And, and so we are bestowed with glory and honour. God has glory and honour. And so do human beings because we reflect His image. No other creature are created in the image of God except human. And therefore, human beings are crowned with glory and honour. So God created humans with glory and honour coded and hardwired into them. God created humans with glory and honour and coded and hardwired uh, with glory and honour coded and hardwired into our psyche, meaning into our soul. There is this awareness. There is this awareness that we are more honourable than everything else. And then we have this desire of honour. As Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 6.2, God gives a man wealth, possessions and honour so that he lacks nothing his heart desires. So that he lacks nothing his heart desires. I mean, we all understand that humans desire wealth, desire power. But there's the other thing that humans, I mean, instinctively desire, and that is honour. Okay? Men are inborn. Okay? Uh, there, there is the inner, inborn desire, even cravings in humans for honour. We seek glory and honour, and we shun disgrace and shame like a plague. Now, according to a recent scientific research paper, Naomi Eisenberger and Matthew Lieberman make the following observation. The pursuit of honour and avoidance of shame appears hardwired into the human brain. The limbic system within our brain senses social threats, example, shame. The same way as physical threats, both types of imminent danger trigger the same self-preservation instinct and share a common neural network, neural basis in the brain. In other words, the human brain and soul are designed for honour. We are designed to live honourably and we are designed to desire honour. In other words, there is nothing wrong for us to desire honour because we are designed with such a capacity. Some people say, no, pastor, it is wrong for us to desire for honour and they quoted maybe a couple of passages. I can give you two examples. Now, these people are point to Jesus criticising the Pharisees for jostling for seats of honour in feasts and the best places in the synagogue. And then another occasion, he told the Pharisees not to choose places of honour in, wedding, in wedding bankers. Okay? But we've got to read what Jesus said very carefully. In these two incidents, Jesus was not criticising the Pharisees for desiring honour. He was castigating them for their pride and for their shameful or shameless uh, uh, lack of humility. 
The desire for honour is legitimate and in fact healthy. However, you cannot buy honour or you cannot engineer honour for yourself. Honour must be conferred on you by other people who give it to you willingly and voluntarily. You do not ask for honour. That will be shameful. That will be shameful. Okay, you wait for people to recognise that you are respectable and they honour you. I've spent a fair amount of time talking about what honour is. Now we shall move on to the second question. Why is honour important? Why is honour important? Now I'll answer the question by first talking about the importance of honour in our relationship with God and then afterwards with people. Firstly, honouring God is important. Honouring God is important. Now, our relationship with God is essentially characterised by our worship. Our relationship with God is essentially characterised by worship. He is God and we are human creature and therefore we worship Him. But a question we've got to ask ourselves is, what is worship? What is the meaning of worship? Now, worship is not just singing praises and hymns to declare our love and our adoration for God. This is an important part of worship, but worship has a broader and deeper meaning. Now, worship comes from the old English word, worship. Worship. Worship means a declaration of God's worthiness with our praise, with our adoration and total submission to His will and purposes. We cannot just do that by singing. We cannot do, just do that by praising. As numerous scripture passages emphasize, we worship Him with our whole heart. We worship Him with our whole life. We obey Him and we live according to His way. That is the meaning of worship. Many contemporary Christians confuse the meaning of worship with coming to church, coming into a community, Christian community, and then we sing and we get emotional about the songs that we sing and we think that is worship. No, worship is more than that. Worship is the declaration of His worth to say that God, You are so worthy that I'll stake my entire life on You. You are so worthy because of who You are and what You have done for us. I will obey You with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. I will worship you with my entire life. And this is only possible if we truly honour God with our life. Let me say that again. This is only possible if we truly honour God with our, with our life, with our heart. In the absence of honour, there is no real worship. In the absence of honour, there is no authentic worship. It is just an empty profession of faith. That is empty religion. Now listen to these words of Isaiah, or rather God speaking to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up of only rules taught by men. Can you see that? Can you see that? Honour is the heart of worship. Honour is the posture of worship. Honour is recognising the worth of God. Honour is recognising the worthiness of God. Honour has always to do with the worth, with worth and value, whether it's a person or thing. God is worthy, so I surrender all. God is worthy, so I submit willingly and completely, totally to His Lordship. Lord, God is worthy and therefore I worship Him. I worship Him. God is worthy and so I honour Him. 
Now in all this, I'm saying this. Honour is the linchpin of our relationship with God. It is that crucial. It is that critical. Without honour, we have no relationship with God, no matter what you think, what you say, and what you do. It is something that modern Christians must understand. It is not just a profession of faith with our mouth. There must be a genuine, ongoing, living relationship with God. And my point is that without honour, there is no worship at all. Without honour, there is no relationship with God at all. God demands that. If you read the book of, of Malachi, God was castigating the Jews, or rather the Israelites, for honouring them with their lips, but not with their heart and their action. Their worship is only lip service. The worship doesn't come from the heart. The worship doesn't translate into anything concrete at all. There was no obedience. There was only external rituals. There was only ceremony. And then, God spoke through the prophet Malachi, telling the people, you are despising me. You are dishonouring me. They miss the heart of worship. They miss the principle of honour in worship. And so they continue with their charade of external rituals and sacrifices. But they withheld the very best from God. They withheld the very best from God. They withheld their tithes from God. And they rationalise. Now many Christians now, they make the same mistakes. They think that they can just go ahead with their religious routines without really honouring God with their heart and with their obedience. They go to church and read the Bible. However, they do not give God their best. They give God their second best. They give God their third best. They give God their fourth best. They give God their life over. If that describes you, you are dishonouring God. These are not my words. You read the book of if you read some of the passages uh, of Isaiah, you read through the entire book of, short book of Malachi, you realize that that is what worship is all about, that is what honor is all about. And God is very, very sticky about that. The authenticity of our relationship with God is demonstrated by our honor for Him. The authenticity of our relationship with God is demonstrated by our honour for Him. I want to give you an illustration. The Western civilization has thrived and prospered tremendously for the last 500 years. Why? Many arguments in regard to this thing. But the central reason is because it is built on the foundation of the Judeo-Christian values, meaning to say that they are built on biblical values, ethics, and principles. But in the recent six decades, the Westerners have systematically dismantled and moved away from these biblical values and ideas that make the society so successful and so prosperous. Now, they frown on anything that has to do with Christianity. They frown on anything that has to do with the Bible. I'm not saying everyone, but in general, a critical mass of them, the bulk of them. Many things can be said, but I'll just say this one thing. Since the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s, the most regrettable being the sexual revolution, the virtue of honour has been completely removed. As a people, they dishonour God Almighty by rebelling against Him and despising His words, His word that their ancestors had embraced. They break away from their cultural and moral moorings in the Judeo-Christian foundation. What did they do? From that time on, from the 1960s on, as a society, as nations, they celebrate free sex 
and many different forms of sexual immorality. As the decades and the years went by, it became worse and worse. And then they disregard the sanctity of life, legalized abortion, affected many other non-Western countries as well. And in the recent years, homosexuality is celebrated and encouraged. And more recently, more recently, lawlessness and violence are celebrated in the streets of America. And if you're keeping up with real news, not fake news, if you're keeping up with real news, you will learn that half of the US government is, is supporting this violence in the streets, this lawlessness in the streets. And it is being encouraged by the media, by the mass media, by the mainstream media, by the academia, that means the universities and, and, and institutions of higher learning, and by Hollywood. In a sense, America has gone bonkers. Why? Why? I mean, we can look at many other, look at many reasons, political reasons, social reasons, this and that. But the underlying reason is given for us in the Bible. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 1. We are witnessing these divine judgments that Paul talked about in Romans chapter 1 playing out right before our eyes. God gave them up first. God gave them up to sexual immorality. Then, they continue in their disobedience, in their re 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 rebellion. God gave them up to perversions. Sexual perversions and all the different kinds of perversion. And finally, God gave them up to a depraved mind. God gave them up to deception. God gave them up to delusion. Otherwise, how do you explain? I mean, as a Singaporean, as an Asian, looking at what's happening over there, and many people I talk to, and people who read real news, they say, how can this ever happen? It doesn't make sense at all. It doesn't make sense what they are encouraging, what they are supporting. It's like they are totally living in delusion. It's a judgment from God according to, according to Paul in Romans chapter 1. God gave them up. God gave them up. And God finally gave them up to a depraved mind that they can't even really understand what's right, what's wrong. And it's not just a leader and a media. A lot of the people think that way because they're educated that way. <clears throat> and if you trace the route, it all goes back to 1960s. It all goes back to 1960s, the cultural revolution, the sexual revolution, the feminist movement and all that. And let me read Romans 1.21 in case you are thinking that I'm making that up. Romans 1.21 For although they knew God, they did not honour Him as God. The Americans knew God. For 200 over years, their ancestors in general, their forebears, they worship God, they understand who the Lord God Almighty is, but they spurn Him. They did not honour Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. For they did not honour God, for they did not honour Him as they should. Can you see that honouring God is such an important thing? It's not just about honour. It has a lot of associated meaning with it. What does God, honouring God mean? I mean, I've just gone through that. It's about worshipping Him. It's about obeying His word. It's about not despising what He says. Honouring God is extremely important. Individuals cannot thrive and societies cannot flourish when God is dishonoured and His word is despised. Now, I know some of you may be thinking, well, what about societies like China, India? They don't know God in their history and they've gone through periods of prosperity and periods of decline. I'll tell you the simple principle. Sometimes honouring God is honouring 
the values and the virtues that God has put into the human consciousness and conscience. They may not know God, but they follow the natural principles of common sense. The society will prosper. A Christian nation, if there's such a thing as a Christian nation, a, a nation that professes themselves to be Christian, walk away from the ways of God. They are not honouring God. A non-Christian nation, that means a nation comprising of largely non-believers, but hold on to sensible societal values. In a sense, they are honouring God. And those principles apply to every society, to every nation. First, honouring God is important. Second, honouring people is also important. So I'm going to talk about honouring people right now. Second, honouring people is also important. Now, most of us are familiar with the fifth commandment. What is the fifth commandment? Exodus 20.12 Honour your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Now, this is one of the most important commandments in the Bible. It was quoted by both Jesus in the Gospel and Paul in his letter to the Ephesians. Now, the very fact that it is featured in the Ten Commandments means that the issue of honour, honouring our father and mother and whatever else it means, are extremely important. Anything that is found in the Ten Commandments is important. The Ten Commandments is, if you look at it from a perspective of law, it's like the Constitution. This is where all the other laws come about. This is where all the other ordinances, all the other precepts derive their truth, their understanding. And in fact, I'll say that Honour is crucial, crucial, if even critical for good family relations and the proper and healthy functioning of a civil society. Now, I'm gonna, not going to tell you the traditional understanding of honouring parents over here. Listen very carefully. Most people look at the commandment at face value and presume that it is just about honouring parents. But I submit to you, that there is more to it than meets the eye. Notice the promise and consequence of honouring your father and mother. What is it? So that you may live long in the land. Everybody say, in the land. So that you may live long in the land your God, the Lord your God is giving you. It is not just about living a long life. There are wider implications beyond you and your family. It has to do with the land. It has to do with the flourishing of your communities. It has to do with the flourishing of your society. It has to do with the flourishing of your country, the land, so that you may live long. I mean, think about it. What for you want to live long in the land that is, has Poverty or is always war-torn and all that. Living long is important, but living long qualitatively is even more important. The impact of honour goes beyond your home to your communities and your society. Where there is honour, your society and communities will do well. Where there is an absence of honour, they will not do well. As we have seen in the case of America, it's not just about not honouring God. Because they don't honour God, they fail to honour one another. And they go around destroying properties, go around telling lies, and all, all those nonsense. Notice its position or order in the Ten Commandments. Honouring our father and mother is the fifth commandment. Now, there's significance in the order. The first three commandments has to do with our vertical relationship with God. The fourth commandment has to do with the Sabbath. It is about the rhythm of life, work and rest, so that we live a good and qualitative, 
are good and good quality, good quality life. The fifth to the tenth commandments have to do with our horizontal relationship with one another. Do you realize that? First three got to do with God. Fourth got to do with work and rest. Fifth to the tenth got to do with our relationship with people. Honor your father and mother is followed by you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witnesses against your neighbor, you shall not cover your neighbor's wife and properties. Now it is very interesting that in addressing how we should relate to people, God began by talking about honor. Honouring your father and mother. Have you ever thought of that? In addressing how we should relate to one another, the fifth to the tenth commandment, God began by talking about honour and He begins by talking about honouring your father and your mother. Why? I think we can find many reasons, but I'll just give you two pertinent reasons. Reason number one, because honour begins at home. Honour begins at home. Honour begins with respecting your father and mother who has given birth to you. Honour flows out of your closest and most intimate relationship. And that is the relationship with your father and mother. If honour is duly and dutifully and lovingly given to your father and mother, you will have no problem honouring every other person that comes into contact with you. Whether people in the church, people in authorities over you, people in the government, people in your school, in your workplace, your peers and your subordinates, you have no problem honouring them. If you know how to honour your parents at home. Secondly, if you know how to honour people, you will not sin and wrong people. Think about it. Let it sing into you. If you know how to honour people, you will not do wrong against them. You will not sin against them. So let's run through the 6, 7, 8, 9 and 10 commandments. You will not murder because that is not honouring to people whom God has created in His image with value and worth. You shall not commit adultery because by doing so, you are dishonouring somebody's spouse. You shall not steal because you are not honouring someone else's rights to their property. You shall not bear false testimony because that's dishonesty and that's destroying someone's Good name is dishonouring to the person. You will not cover your neighbour's wife and stuff because it is disrespecting to your neighbour. You realise that everything is, has a connective, there's a connective tissue between honour and all these other commandments concerning how we should relate to people. You shall not, you shall not, you shall not. If you have honour, you will not. If you understand honour, you will not. And honour begins at home. Honour begins by honouring the father and mother who has given birth to you. If that is in order, everything else will be in good order. Now it is often said that individual family units are the basic building blocks of our society. Do we agree with that? Okay, we all should agree with that. It is a true statement. Okay, it's observed, but it is a true statement. So it follows that if the culture and practice of honour is present in a critical mass of individual homes, then the society will also experience the value of honour. If in every home, everybody honour their parents. That will be translated into honouring people in the various walks of society. Isn't it so? 
and where there is a culture of honour, that society will thrive and flourish. Because social interaction, governing and business activities will be conducted virtuously, respectfully and in a lawful and orderly manner. On the other hand, when there is no culture of honour in the society, there will be dishonesty, unbridled covetousness, selfishness, lack of graciousness, contentiousness, and so on, leading to immorality, crimes, corruption, erosion of trust, disorderliness, social unrest, and then you have poor business environment, etc., etc. So you see that honour for people is an indispensable value for a functional and healthy civil society. Honour for God, honour for people. Both are important. Let me conclude today's sermon by saying this. If you want to thrive in your life and see flourishing in your communities and society, resolve to cultivate the virtue of honour. At a personal level, resolve to cultivate the virtue of honour. Create a culture of honour for yourself and then work towards creating a culture of honour for every community that you are in. If you are in a leadership position, maybe think of ways in which you could foster the culture of honour. If you are not, behave honourably. Behave respectfully. Be the sword, be the light, be the example. Okay, make the world around you a better place. Pursuing the virtue of honour is a noble desire. Okay, I sound like Confucius, but that's very biblical. Okay, that's very biblical. Pursuing the virtue of honour is a noble desire. It begins with you. Live honourably, show respect and give honour to everyone around you. Even if the people around you don't bother. Show respect anyway. Give honour anyway. Pursue honour and God's blessings of favour, glory and honour will be upon you. Now today what I've done is to sketch for you the idea of what honour is and then to tell you the importance of honour. In the next few weeks, we'll just go into the certain, some of the specific. How do we honour God? And then I'm going to talk about honour's rewards. There's so many rewards attached to honour. Okay, it is a root of a lot of blessing in life. So there are many things that can be said this morning, but I've chosen to say what I've said, and I hope that you find it enriching, you find it informative and you find that uh, it is something that can resonate in your heart and that as you think about it, it will be something that will motivate you to say, yeah, honour is not just important, honour is something that I would like to have so that I can live a life that is pleasing to God so that I can be a good member of my community. Amen? Shall we all stand?